Okay, Jules, let's kick off. Okay, hey everyone. Welcome. I'm so glad to be here today, joined by such amazing panelists. So for those who don't know, the theme of today's panel is going to be breaking into fintech. And just in case you don't know who I am or any of the panelists are, we're just going to run through and do some introductions. So just to kick things off, my name is Jules Emanuele. I am formerly a software engineer and product manager at JP Morgan. It's been three and a half years there. Um, doing a variety of roles in the financial services space. Uh, about two weeks ago, I started a new job at a 20 person startup as a product manager. Uh, Shiley, would you like to introduce yourself? Give us your name, your job title, where you work, and maybe a fun fact about yourself. Cool. Thanks, Jules. So, yeah, I'm Shiley. I'm a product owner at JP Morgan, focusing in cloud and data enterprise technology, uh, previously a data engineer. And uh, my fun fact is that I speak three and a half languages and I say half because I can't really claim French. I don't speak it super well anymore, but uh, I'd love to get back into it. Thanks, Jules. Awesome. Lane, you want to jump in next? Hi, so I'm Lane McIntyre. I'm an iOS engineer at Square working on Cash App on the global team, um, which is basically responsible for expanding Cash App into different countries. And I've been working in FinTech for about a year and a half now and a software engineer for four years. Um, and a fun fact is that I like to ice skate in my free time. Ooh. Is that like a cook? Is that like, how do you do that in COVID or, or, or rink so <laughs> cool? Uh, yeah, so the, my rink just opened last night um, for lessons and basically they're doing it all like distance and everything. It's kind of weird, but I'm glad to be back on the ice after about six months. It's amazing. As a kid, I wanted to be Michelle Kwan. Um, I'm sure <laughs> little girls did in the in the 90s. Um, but that I like literally was not good. I like was afraid to like do the, the like the fun cross one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's an awesome fun fact. And John, can you introduce yourself? Yes, hi, Jules. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Roa. I'm Senior Director of Engineering at Lending Fund. Lending Fund is a company that created uh, wide, wide label solutions uh, to handle loans uh, to small businesses. And a fun fact is that I like bicycles and I, got, I like to go really fast. That's, that's awesome. Also very scary, but awesome. Really, really cool. <laughs> okay, awesome. So we're just gonna jump into the questions here. Uh, anyone just like jump in to answer a question and yeah, let's, let's run with it. Um, so let's just start off with how did you get to where you are now? Lane, I'm going to volunteer you. <laughs> okay. Um, so basically, um, I started out as a software engineer right out of college. I was working at this um, small boutique consulting um, firm doing QA and some um, like office admin stuff. And basically, I was like, hey, I just graduated. I want to be a software engineer. You know, can you offer me, offer me a job? And they ended up um, teaching me iOS programming. Um, and I kind of like spent two years there working on a bunch of different client projects um, and kind of like got my feet wet with um, iOS app development. And then um, the next year uh, after that, I, in my third year of iOS engineering, I started at this company called Zap Labs, which makes, um, it's not in FinTech, but it makes apps for real estate companies. And um, from there, I actually got recruited um, into Tally, which is a small startup that helps people pay off their credit card debt. So that was kind of my first experience in FinTech. And I think that um, I, once I started working there, I kind of got the impression that in FinTech as a whole, but especially at like a lot of startups um, in that space, people are just extremely passionate about um, the mission and like getting people more access to either financial information or access to capital to pay down credit card debt or, you know, different things like that. So once I was there, I was kind of like, okay, I think this is the place like I want to end up and continue going. Um, so most recently, about two months ago, I joined Square um, and I'm working again on Cash App and um, the I get the same sense here that, that I did at Tally in terms of just everyone kind of coalesces around the mission um, of like making people better off financially by giving them more access, especially to underserved communities. So that's kind of my story, how I ended up here and why I'm here. 
That's awesome. Finding purpose in what you do is like the whole point of working. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's definitely something that we try and drive home just at the WIT project a lot and you know, why we're, we do what we do and why we think like these panels are so important so people can understand. FinTech, you can make a lot of amazing impact with it as well. Uh, so John, mm-hmm. do you want to kind of give us a lowdown on how you got to where you are now? Absolutely, hey, Jules. Uh, well, it started when I was a kid. I really liked video games. Um, and for some reason, I, I really like to install those games. And I got to know that there were some packages to be installed and I start to reach a, a little bit about that to, fa- to find out what it was about. And I ended up uh, learning how to code when I was 15 years old. Um, then I started uh, college and I'm a, a college dropout, but I, I kept a constant um, passion to, uh, to, uh, with programming. And I really like uh, like how to create user interfaces. And my for, my first formal job was documenting uh, software, so I was creating a, taking snapshots, describing what were the features or the fields, the, the type of the of, of the data, um, in those fields. And I, I made my way uh, through. I became a junior software engineer, mid level, senior team lead, and so on. So so far, I have been in the industry like twelve years. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. awesome. That's really cool. I'm sure yeah. you've seen a lot in the in those in those twelve years. <laughs> yeah, it, it's been fun. My mom is still waiting for the for my final um, to to get graduate on uh, as a, a software engineer, the formal education title. But <laughs> someday she will get it. <laughs> yeah. I think that's like one of the best things about this profession is you don't really need any. I mean, you have it like good for you, like. You know, you made it through those hard CS math classes, but I think it's like perfect for people who are lifelong learners who just want to keep keep learning and building. So there's a poll out right now. If the participants are looking for it, asking about years of experience. Um, so John would fall into the upper, the 10 plus <laughs> category. <laughs> um, and while we're doing that, Shiley, do you want to just give us a rundown of how you got where you are? Yeah, totally. So I would fall into like, the bottom category in terms of years of experience. Like I graduated from school about three years ago. Um, My path was very nonlinear. I studied math. I was really into applying statistics in the bio uh, genetics field. Um, That was my way to translate technology into social good. Um, And then through more mentorship, I came to realize that academia wasn't a good cultural fit for me. And I thought I'd go try my my shot in industry um, and came across this program called Tech Connect at JP Morgan. And I'm constantly plugging this experience because it led me to meet Jules and so many other awesome colleagues. Um, It's a diversity pipeline for individuals that have nonlinear path from marginalized communities to break into technology. Um, And essentially it provides like a three month software engineering boot camp into the regular software engineering program. So students coming right out of school that have CS degrees, we are just like well integrated into that program after we graduate from Tech Connect. And we never really graduate because we stay very good friends. Um, They are our support system and probably the biggest reason why I've been able to overcome many of the challenges that I've faced as a woman in tech, as a person of color. Um, and there are lots of opportunities to kind of give back at JP Morgan, which I think kind of really, um, helped me nurture my passion for supporting the different communities that I'm a part of. And I know Jules can definitely attest to that as well in terms of her own personal experience. And that is kind of what led us to found the WIT project. So I'll just briefly touch on what the WIT project is. It's an initiative that we founded last July, um, with the intention to empower women and people of color um, that are in the CUNY system to essentially create um, an opportunity for them to learn how to create technology and build software for other nonprofits. Um, and it was such an amazing experience. We learned so much and Jules can definitely jump in and share kind of what she thinks about the WIT project. And I mean, we're really passionate and this year we are growing uh, very rapidly and doubling our effort. And so that's kind of why we're here today with Outco. So yeah, that's a little bit about me and the WIT project. Yeah, no, so just uh, the WIT project's really amazing initiative that 
you know, we were all about trying to help students figure out like what the best career path is for them once they enter tech and how they can, you know, enter a workforce that is aware of how to empower people who are diverse. And so they feel not just like there, there's diversity in the workplace, but they also feel inclusiveness in their workplace. Um, that's something that's been really nice, but our experience so far in working in FinTech has been, you know, like we've been empowered by the jobs that we've had to be able to explore that. And I think that very much echoes what Lane was talking about is understanding social good and benefit. So the WIP project, we really think that like, you know, working with nonprofits is super important and we'll dive up, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but how as you build your career, you can also understand the impact that technology has. Um, and I think it really helps people who are marginalized groups in tech to feel a, a stronger foothold within the larger com uh, technology community. So for our next question, uh, I was gonna ask all of y'all, what is something unique about FinTech that you know you think will surprise people? Shelly, I'll go backwards this time. You wanna go first? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so something about, I guess in my own experience, I've only worked at JP Morgan in terms of my own full-time job and it's a huge bank. It's like one of the largest banks in the world. Um, and a lot of people have this preconception that technology at banks are really outdated and they are not uh, one to really be on the cutting edge. And uh, that's just not the case. In my own group, I work in the chief technology office. Our entire job is to build enterprise tech while adopting the latest and greatest. And so we're moving to public cloud. We're enabling um, teams to leverage AI at scale. We are uh, we have a blockchain center of excellence. We have a lot of initiatives at the firm that are really looking to adopt the latest technology to really enable us to reach our maximum capacity of innovation. Um, so that's been a really cool experience to kind of see that perspective of finance and technology kind of meeting. Um, so, yeah. Uh, later, Don, do either of you want to jump in? Um, yes. Um, in the case of uh, Lent in front. I, I really like the mission of helping those financial companies that were really good at getting customers, but had some opportunities to improve on the technology side. So what Lend in front created this uh, this platform to say, hey, you focus on the on the customers. We take care of the technology, and we are all happy. So uh, having that opportunity to get multiple companies uh, to use top notch technology while they grow. And at the same time, small businesses uh, have, uh, have a benefit of getting uh, money to keep growing. That, that, that's part of the, of the mission that, that I, I was hooked in. Um, yeah, for sure. I think um, one thing that even like I kind of had a preconceived notion about in FinTech before joining um, Tally was that basically FinTech just meant all these companies are trying to be banks and trying to like upend the bank banking industry. And I was like, well, what's the value in that? I don't really know. But like since working in FinTech, I realized that, that it encompasses so much more than that. And there's so many opportunities to help people um, outside of like just creating a neo bank or what have you. Yeah, no. Oh, we got a cat. We got a cat in the cat. <laughs> Lane, what's your cat's name? Cheeto. I love it. I, I love all the work from home, like people running in. I was like, <laughs> yeah. someone who was at a playground chasing her two year old around the playground. Um, and I was like, this is such work from home vibes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's awesome. I, I think like people always, you know, echo what everyone says, don't realize that there's a ton of opportunities in FinTech. There's a, a, so many different kind of routes you can go with it. People only ever mm -hmm. think about like some of the more consumer tech thing. Like when I remember in the beginning when I first started working at JPMorgan, they were like, oh, you work on Chase.com. And I was like, I have never gotten near Chase.com. <laughs> so the, what's really cool about FinTech is you can just go, all over and you can definitely um you know you can experience a lot of different opportunities you get to work on things like you know things that could be similar like apple pay where it impacts millions of people or you could work on something that you know only traders see so really cool you know opportunities to do a lot of different things um so john this one's for you because you are a hiring manager 
Um, so how do you, can you speak about how people with non-traditional technology backgrounds can differentiate themselves in interviews? Okay, well, I, I love these questions. I, I think there are many ways, but I would say that the main is actually regardless on, the, on how strong you are in technology, the main thing to do is to do a hard research about the company you're being interviewed. Uh, for example, if, I'm, if I want to work uh, at Google at a specific project or at, at a small startup, I, what I would do is, for example, to, to send an, uh, a LinkedIn message to one of the senior engineers or one manager and get some information. How, what is their experience working at that company? Uh, how did you manage to, to get hired in that company? What is the best perform the top performer and why that person is the top performer Get so those characteristics. So when a person has done their, 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 their work and their, their job doing that research, they could be very prepared when they get uh, uh, in, the, in the interviews, right? Because some of the times t t technology companies of course, they need somebody that is uh, that has technology skills, right? But at the same time, you're looking for a person that has a high level of self-learning. Self and that demonstrates that, that you can learn on your own and be proactive. That is the second element. So when you are proactive, it doesn't matter if you are like a mid-level iOS developer, you can get better. You can get some, uh, get some training and do some extra uh, work and, and learn more. Uh, but if you don't have that key element of being self-learning and having a great productivity, maybe you will be stuck or have like a normal speed. So you can differentiate by moving faster. And that, that could be like the big element that, that I would highlight. Yeah, no, totally agree with that. I think like in life, you gotta, you gotta be your own hype man. That's why, or hype woman, hype person. 2020. Let's be woke about this. Uh, Lane or Shiley, anything you want to add from any experience you've had, you know, helping people get jobs or kind of break in? I would definitely agree with what John says. Um, just do your research and um, really have a reason why you're applying for the particular position and tell the recruiter or whoever you're talking to, the hiring manager, that. Because I think, you know, when you when I have gone into interviews in the past and the candidate just is super excited about the company and knows a lot about the work we do, then that just um, kind of like is definitely a, a signal that there's, you know, something there um, before we even get into talking about their skills and like what they can bring to the position. Just being excited is a big hurdle. And a lot of people come in thinking, well, I have the skills, that's all I need. And it's like, yeah, I mean, you do need the skills, but it d definitely helps uh, you as a candidate to be really excited about the places you're applying to. Yeah, 100%. I think at the WIT project, we always tell our students, you know, you have to be able to bring your whole self to an interview. It's not just like, let me bring the analytical part of my brain, problem solving only, like bring your whole self. If you can't be your genuine whole self in an interview or to an employer, you know, you're never going to feel comfortable in the workplace, but also people appreciate when, when you are your genuine self and when you are genuinely interested, you know, um, it's like a very powerful skill to learn. Mm -hmm. um, Charlie, did you have anything you want to add in here? Yeah, just touching off of what you just mentioned, Jules, about like bringing your whole self to an interview. You might think that your non-traditional experiences, like let's say being a tutor or like a babysitter or a mentor at a hackathon, something that's like not related to that specific job may have zero uh, ability to translate into the actual job title or like the skill set. Um, but being able to make those, um, those experiences look va of value um, is really awesome in the interview process to be able to diversify yourself as a candidate. And like an, ex an example of that is like for the WIT project, when we're interviewing candidates and they tell us that they were a tutor, um, that can translate well into, oh, this person probably has really strong communication skills. And we're able to see that they're like working on that in other spaces. So don't discount your other experiences that aren't just like coding or something that's on your GitHub. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, and that's when like doing fun, impactful projects come in, right? Like 
if you do some tech for social good projects that help nonprofits, like, you know, do programs like the Lit Project, it helps bolster your resume. Or while you're going through a boot camp, you do, don't just do the projects that are assigned to the boot camp, you do side projects, or you collaborate with friends, and then you continuously build community as you're trying to get into this field. So that's all really great, great tips. Um, so what is something interesting and innovative? I feel like we just like, this is very similar. I'm gonna take back that question. Um, <laughs> how have you found for those of us who have worked in different industries, um, how have you found working in a different industry versus FinTech? So um, for me personally, like I've been in a new job for two weeks. I thought it'd be really different. It's only slightly different. So, you know, I'll let the panelists get uh, taken away a bit more, but I haven't been that shocked to, you know, see a differential industry to industry, but. You know. I'm kind of surprised that, that you say that Jules. I mean, it's so different. Like you went from banking to like a consumer product. It's so different, but wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I guess I also want to like cancel myself out from this question only because I've only worked in banking since I graduated from school. Uh, so I'll leave it for Lane and John to jump in here. So I think um, one thing that I've noticed is a big difference is if you, at least at the companies I've worked at, if you ask someone kind of like what drew them to apply there or why they wanted to get a job there, they invariably mention the mission um, and like they know what the mission is and they can articulate why it matters and why they want to help with it and how their work furthers that mission. Whereas at other companies, I feel like that was less the case. It was more like, okay, we're building real estate apps or I'm, you know, consulting with different projects. And there wasn't really a sense from everyone that we're working together towards this goal. Um, and I think that that's something that's been really powerful at the companies I've worked at in the FinTech space. Yeah, that, that's really, really true. And that's some good insights. Uh, and John, I figure you have to say something too. Just jump in and cut me off. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. yeah, in this case, it has been interesting in fintech that one way to say that I'm not an expert on fintech, but one way to say it is that fintech companies are either transforming an industry or helping traditional companies to get up to speed. Yeah. So that being said, that the the, the whole fintech um, business um, let's say knowledge is is quite is it has complexity right there there are interests there are a bunch of things type of products and um that is that is very very that's fascinating in, when you are building software because you, you have to to think harder on how to create a design that allows flexibility but at the same time does what is what is supposed to be done in terms of business uh, flows, for example. So that is something that it, that it caught my attention on fintech, while in other industries, of course, the other industries has their complexities, but in this particular case, I have found um, the complexity level is, is higher, and that's become, that become uh, more challenging, and more, more interesting to, to Yeah, 100%. I, I've seen it um coming from like I was working in investment banking, sales and trading, building tech for three years, which is like so niche and specialized that when I was looking for other jobs in FinTech, I would talk to like a payments company and they would be like, you know nothing about anything relevant to what we do. Um, so I think what's so interesting is that there's a lot of specializations. It really can go from like internal tech, infrastructure tech, consumer tech. Um, and then within that, you have all the different levels and everything's so regulated that there's a lot of specialization in there and a lot of complexity. That's actually the biggest difference between switching industries is I actually feel so prepared for my new job because I'm like, this will never, this is not as, doesn't feel as complicated as figuring out like what a bond does and like how it moves through all the hundred million legacy systems that it, it has to move through. Um, which is also very specialized in banking. Okay, so going down the list again. Um, so, you know, we've been talking a lot about FinTech and, you know, hyping it up a lot and like what a great industry it is. And, you know, what advice can we give to students who are trying to figure out a way, you know, who want to work in it or, you know, who want to get into the field, but also maybe people who just like ha are pivoting in their careers, right? People who are in boot camps or coming from like, um, you know, a different industry, they went to a boot camp and now they're trying to get into FinTech. 
um, you know, essentially just like for their first job out of a boot camp or out of college. Um, what advice do we have for them? Lynn. I would say um, one big thing is just download fintech apps and play around with them. Um, I think that getting to know the products it can help you kind of see like what you like, what you don't like. And um, then from there, you can kind of build that excitement for applying um, and bring that into, um, you know, your conversations with recruiters and hiring managers. Um, and I think, you know, just get your tech skills down, um, you know, definitely practice um, whiteboarding and doing like online coding challenges. I think that that kind of applies for any software engineering interview. Um, and then, you know, just know, know the places you're applying and know why you want to apply there and be able to articulate, articulate that um, because that's, I think, something that's very important, um, especially in like initial conversations with the company. They want to know, why'd you apply? And you need to be able to say like, this is why I really like your product or I'm really dr driven by your mission. Um, so yeah, I would just say, get to know the companies um, that, that interest you and maybe like branch out a little bit into places you didn't maybe think would be um, all that interesting. You could be surprised if you end up playing with the apps and seeing like, oh, actually this one does a lot of things I didn't realize. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think it's, and I think this like goes to like a lot of industries too, like as you were saying, like don't go into an interview and have no idea what the product does or what the company does. Like that's just a bad look at every industry. And especially with like, if you're doing consumer FinTech, you like everyone has no, everyone has paid with Square probably, you know? Like you build that connection with the, with the product. Charlie, you want to chime in here? Yeah. So there are a few ways that I could suggest getting intimate with the product. Um, a lot of these companies end up posting hackathons on dev posts that are sponsored. And what they'll do is they'll actually create access to their APIs so that you can build small projects and applications leveraging their specific technologies. Um, and that's a way to demonstrate committed interest to that company that you actually had a chance to interact with like their data and like you had a cool idea about how to display it or give access to other people to, I don't know, use a web application that leverages that data or something like that. Um, so that's, that's huge. And that's also another opportunity for you to work with other people. Being able to demonstrate that you are strong at working in a team setting is huge. Um, being able to address like challenging conversations or coming to a compromise about how to design a specific solution. Those are all things that hiring managers honestly place a lot of value on. Um, and finally, like you need experiences to talk through when you're in an interview process. And so having those hands-on experiences, working on a project for a hackathon or for your own personal pleasure um, will give you a lot of foundational experience to kind of talk through. So uh, those are just some tips that I would totally recommend. Yeah, amazing. John, anything else you want to add in here? Yes, um, I would say an additional one would be to make uh, uh, to do a lot of questions when you are being interviewed, uh, especially when you are joining a small company and you have the chance to to get in a call with the CEO or the CTO or one of the founders. That is a great opportunity to get information about the motivation of why that person. Uh, started the company, what was their vision, what was their previous job, and, and they quit, and what was that process, uh, how that process looked like. That usually brings a lot of heart in that, because that, that is a, a usually an emotional and a hard decision for a founder to quit and start a company. So that information would give you more um, context on what, are, what, what that person is, is looking to, to do with this company and how far do they want to, to get. And based on that, sometimes this sounds a little bit romantic, but when you have this kind of conversations, you can, have, you can feel like a, a connection. You say, yes, the, this is the, the kind of uh, person I would, I, I would like to work with and help that, that person and that company to grow. Yeah. Um. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think like it's a, oh, we got another poll. Um, um, so yeah, so I, I think that's awesome. Um, yeah, all of those th responses are great. And I think like 
hopefully all the students and people who are pivoting in their careers are figuring out some, are getting some good tips out of this. Um, as a follow-up to something Shiley said, someone asked, what is the best way to get informed about hackathons and upcoming events? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are so many platforms that kind of crowdsource this information. Um, DevPost is one of the most popular where hackathons from all over the world are actually posted. Um, there are other platforms like F6S and honestly, like LinkedIn is like a big place where people are constantly posting about opportunities that are hackathon-esque, even if they're not like formal hackathons. Um, but yeah, a another one is if you're a student, you can go to the MLH website. Um, there are lots of hackathons posted there. And a lot of, since the pandemic hit, they've opened up these hackathons to people who aren't students. So if you're a prof like a young professional or just any professional, you can jump into the hackathon as a participant or even a mentor. So there's so many different ways to get involved. Um, you just have to look for them. Awesome. Yeah. There's literally so many things to get involved with. It's overwhelming at times. I remember I used to have too many events to attend that I was like, I'm, I'm networking too much. I'm hack hacking too much, hackathoning. I don't know what the, the active verb is for that. <laughs> I'm hacking too much. Kind of sounds like I'm trying to like steal someone's money though, which is not good on a FinTech panel. Um, uh, so yeah, I think all of those hold true. So just shifting a little bit about, you know, to go back to the kind of stuff that goes on at the companies we all work at. Um, I would love to hear from each of the panelists how um, you think, um, your, like what your company like, could you talk through a bit what your company does to empower diverse communities who are employees? So uh, women, people of color, LGBTQ, um, all the other, you know, all the un underrepresented communities within the workplace. Um, how do you think your, what your company, you just talk through what your company does that's unique? Yeah, I can start off here. Um, JP Morgan is a really special organization in which they've done an amazing job in diversifying the types of programs and opportunities um, they provide to these marginalized communities. Um, I keep talking about Tech Connect, like that is a huge example of a, of a program that they have a dedicated commitment into getting more representation of people from the communities that we're a part of um, into the technology workforce. And there are so many others. There are programs that help people who have been out of the workforce for a really long time to retrain them. There are programs that help people with disabilities and autism to become QAs. Um, there are other opportunities like, like super days for students that want to come see what it's like to be an analyst at the company. Um, so many hackathons. And then also this one program called force for good that does a really great job of connecting technology, sorry, technologists at the bank, um, to nonprofits and helping them build a solution over the course of one year. Um, and so we have had a really big opportunity to kind of be a part of those initiatives and learn a lot from how those initiatives are as scalable as they can be, which is one of the biggest perks of being able to have the resources and their reputation to reach all of these people. Um, so it's cool that JP Morgan actually takes responsibility of the influence that they have. So yeah, those are just some things that I'll call out. Cool. Lynn? Um, in my time at Square, one thing that's really struck me is the um, the influence of the employee resource groups um, and basically how easy it is to get one started. Um, and so there's a really, really strong um, women in engineering group at Square um, that has events monthly and um, they're really fostering um, women who are in the engineering department and kind of bringing those connections and getting the opportunity to network. So for me, that's been really big. Um, and I know that, you know, there's similar resource groups for other um, groups of people, um, like people of color, um, people with different religions, um, people who have um, indigenous ancestry, like just basically anything where people can come together, like based around that um, identity, there's probably something that exists or people that want to start that. So that's been um, a really cool thing to see coming into Square. That's awesome. I love hearing about all the cool different programs that companies have, because like, unless you're on the inside of it, a lot of times you don't see it unless there's like really big companies that have like crazy CSR. Um, and John, I'd love to hear about what's going on at your company. 
Okay, yeah, in our case, although the, our company is, is small, it's still small, um, we have been doing our best uh, to sponsor, for example, some of the Python meetup um, events in Colombia, because most of the of the of the engineering team um, lives in Colombia. So we have managed to sponsor some of the events. Also, um, I, I am um, I am the, the the lead organizer of the conference in Colombia, a PyCon conference, and they are very flexible with with me taking time for for the organizing the event and also uh, some team members they they join the organization the organization and and they use their time to 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 help the the uh, conference to execute uh, as it should so yeah that that's that's how we do it. That's, that's awesome i think no matter the size of the company it's really important that companies have that on their radar. Um, I think companies with bad culture can't grow and can't thrive. It's really important to have good culture. Um, and that's something that we strive towards to kind of all the people that we partner with at the WIT project, we strive to push that out to all the companies. Like you in, in whatever capacity you can and whatever size you are, you can do social good. You can empower women and underrepresented groups in tech. Um, you just have to have a genuine agenda around it. You have to listen to people who feel underrepresented. So that leads to my next question, which is, I would love to hear, and if you, know, if you, you don't wanna answer this one, you don't have to, but how do you think about giving back to underrepresented communities in tech personally? Like, so it could be something you do at your job, it could be something you do as an extracurricular. Um, I'll let Shiley go first, because I know you, you could probably just talk about the web project. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about. So uh, thankfully, I have a really awesome team of people that I work, sorry, volunteer with at the WIT project, where we're able to dedicate our time to creating a program that will support the development professionally and personally of students um, from these marginalized communities. And something that is really amazing about what we're doing at the WIT project is that we're providing this essence of community that sometimes is really hard to, I guess, like authentically find in a classroom, especially virtually. So um, that's actually something that our students gave us amazing feedback on this past year is that the freshmen and sophomores didn't really have that many friends. And as soon as things went virtual, they were kind of alone and isolated in their classes. And being a computer science or technology student is already challenging in it itself. And when you have to go through these, these courses on your own and not have people to ask questions to or have somebody to complain to about the things you're struggling with, it can get really hard. And that's something that uh, personally, I felt has been so helpful in my own experience um, as, as a technologist is that I do have mentorship and I have the support because I've sought it out and recognized the value in it. And so the WIT project really focuses on providing those mentorship opportunities so that they feel like they have that support. And then also that translates into the our ability to impact these other nonprofit organizations that traditionally may not have had the resources to dedicate towards technology and recognizing the value in uh, introducing those small changes that will enable them to scale and aggressively reach their missions. Um, and we're just guiding our students to doing that. And that's like the most amazing part. So yeah, um, that's the WIT project in a nutshell. That's awesome. And what project's amazing. So if you don't know about it, I really, really recommend checking us out on LinkedIn, the Wit Project. Or Instagram. Uh, Instagram, at the Wit Project. Or our website, thewitproject.com. Really, really simple. Um, literally just the name, the Wit Project. Uh, Lane, so I hope you've had some time to reflect on this. Uh, love to hear what you're up to in your, <laughs> at work or in your free time. Yeah, um, one thing that I think is really important, um, like Shaylee has mentioned, is just having men mentorship opportunities. So that's something that I've tried to like put out there to um, folks who are a bit more junior than me. Is just like you know, if you want to have a one-on-one, -on -one, if you want to talk about anything besides work, or you know, how you get a promotion, or just kind of anything. Like I always put that out there to folks. And um, at Tally, I did have the opportunity to mentor a junior engineer. 
um, who was from an underrepresented background. And just, you know, it's very rewarding um, to kind of be able to see someone grow be and not necessarily like, oh, because I was talking to them, but just kind of see like, okay, I can see some changes, like their code is getting a little cleaner or like they're asserting themselves more in meetings or they're feeling more empowered to speak up. Like all of those things I feel um, when you are the only ex in the room, like the only woman in the room or um, the only person of color in the room, then it's really hard to kind of break that barrier and be like, I'm going to speak up and I'm going to make my voice heard. So just any opportunity I can give to um, empower folks is uh, really important to me. Yeah, that's amazing. That's the, all we can try and do every day. I power pose every morning. I'm like, I got this today. Today's the day that I'm going to stand up. So John, your last, uh, to give us some, some insights. Um, okay, yeah, in, in regards to the underrepresented uh, communities in tech, for example, I, I spend a fair share of my time uh, with the PyCon Colombia event. And in that event, we uh, have a specific special alliance with Django Girls uh, community. Um, and in that, in that event, in, with that community, what we do is during the, the conference, there is, a, there is a specific space for the young girls to, to execute their, their tutorials or their workshops. Yeah, and, and, we, and we do our best to cover some expenses. And, and some of the time I, I go there and I, I become, I have played the role as mentor for, um, in, in, the, in, the, in the workshops. So yeah, that that's, has been done for, for a while. Awesome. We are big fans of Django Girls. Uh, so that's cool to hear you collaborate them with them. Uh, they're like intro to Django, um, like tutorial is, is awesome for people getting started. Um, if anyone's trying to learn Django or brush bones of Python skills, check out the Django Girls tutorial. We use it uh, in our project curriculum. So awesome that you collaborate with them. So one last question before I let you all go. It's kind of like a fun question just like everyone thinking about um you know how do finance fin fintech kind of tech can be leveraged in outside industries how do you see nonprofits? um how could they benefit from using you know having more access to the technologists who work at fintech firms or fintech technology um because it's quite expensive a lot of times and a lot of nonprofits don't have the budgets for it um Charlie, you want to you want to go first here yeah, absolutely. Um, something that I learned really early on um, at JP Morgan was um, the benefits of leveraging cloud technologies, like managed cloud technologies, whether it was like it's a SaaS or a PaaS or an IaaS. Um, it that that uh, business model essentially democratizes access to resources by paying as you go. Um, and making those resources really readily available and managed means that it's an easy approach to get into, um, I guess, like these technologies that may traditionally be like sourced by high tech or fintech or other industries that have the actual uh, dedicated teams to leverage these services. And like a big example of that is like uh, Salesforce, like lots of nonprofits leverage this managed cloud-based service because it helps them manage a lot of their work streams. Um, so and we see lots of big companies leveraging products like Salesforce as well. And what's cool is that these massive platforms also have uh, discounts, like deep discounts for other nonprofits. Like Microsoft Cloud has a, a really cool partnership with lots of nonprofits. So does Salesforce. They even create dedicated products specifically for nonprofit organizations. So it's just kind of about creating accessibility to that information and making it consumable so that nonprofits can actually translate their challenges into how they could leverage those technologies. And also having uh, technologists volunteering to help them consume those technologies, replugging the WIT project. So, yeah. Awesome. Now, Elaine, any, anything to add here? Um, I think apart from the technology aspect, one thing um, that I've seen be really beneficial for both um, FinTech companies and nonprofits is to partner together on um, different initiatives. And maybe it's not necessarily like, you know, we're providing you with a certain technology, but it's more just like we are like 
coming together to work on a project, um, maybe outside of the technology realm, um, to advance a cause that is important to the company. Um, and I know like I've, there have definitely been companies that I've worked at that have worked with like Hack the Hood, um, which is a nonprofit to um, increase um, the participation of underrepresented minorities in the tech industry. So like it, it doesn't necessarily need to be surrounding technology. It can just be like, we're partnering together. We're um, mentoring people who are going through the program um, and we're providing that kind of support and opportunities for potentially like internships or jobs in the future. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity to, um, you know, get, get your name out there as a nonprofit by partnering with a FinTech company. Yeah, a hundred percent. It's also just like a great way if you're just trying to break into FinTech or break into, you know, tech in general, right? Like volunteer with a nonprofit, get some hands-on coding experience. They probably partner with larger orgs can help get, connect you in like everything in life. Like, you know, it's, it's, everything's interconnected. So it's a really cool other kind of path that you can use to try and, you know, volunteer, do some good, but also maybe make some connections to get a job. Um, okay. John, is there anything you want to add or, or are you good? Um, yeah, I would say that besides um, leveraging the financial services technology, I would say le leverage the fintech talent. And what I mean by that is that when you have this amazing team that somehow can help a nonprofit organization, for example, when I, when I, a few years ago, um, I, joined, I helped um, a, a nonprofit organization called uh, CodeRise. And it was to, to teach children how to program, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I joined because I was very interested uh, about technology and how to explain a, a relatively complex term to mm -hmm. uh, children. Yeah, for me that was a fascinating uh, topic to handle. So I, I even started to read about teaching about ch children, and I say, okay, what what are the the methodologies that are out there? To teach how to program and and that in a personal uh, experience it, it helped me um to know how to communicate with teams when i'm in my daily job if i'm able to to share uh, to explain a kid how a for loop works or an if statement works or a class that that would definitely uh, that was definitely helpful for me to communicate to a board or a CEO or a CTO, how would a project work? Yeah. So one way to do it is like to get to to get help uh, from the team members of, of a company and get them to join those non nonprofits. And you can see how they can refine some skills, sometimes uh, soft skills, and contribute to those nonprofits. And at the same time, you get a benefit of those professionals getting better. Yeah, a hundred. Yeah, hundred percent. I think it's it's a great, great way to kind of you know be able to use those skills to you know do some good. Um, so we're at the end of our question list here. If anyone has any final burning questions, I urge you to type ferociously into the Q and A chat or or the regular chat. I don't know the difference. I'm not that fancy with my Zoom usage. Um, <laughs> And in the meantime, let's just do a quick recap. So uh, hopefully this was really helpful for those trying to learn more about the different kinds of jobs and roles you can have in the FinTech industry. We got, oh, we got a question. Yeah, that question was, was covered. There, there's one question that I've seen. Yes. Um, so we kind of covered this, but I guess we can just go into it again, um, would you say that it's difficult for someone without work experience in FinTech to kind of get a job in FinTech um, as their like first role as an engineer, um, coming out of a boot camp, not coming out of college? Yeah, so I feel like we did cover a lot of the themes here. Um, one thing to keep in mind is to diversify your portfolio by doing um, hackathons or leveraging open source APIs of companies that you're interested in. Like JP Morgan has an API store, Square has an API, just creating projects like 
on your personal time, maybe with other people that you can demonstrate that you're interested, that you're curious, um, and that you also have experience building technology that is unique to that specific company it can really give you an edge. Um, and you can translate a lot of your past experience into a current role. So in hospitality, you probably had a lot of experience with communication and like uh, conflict resolution, like definitely hone in on how that could translate in helping to manage a team or driving forward compromise on design discussions and stuff like that. Um, you can definitely get creative, but the finance industry is not something that's impossible to break into if you curate and present yourself in a way that makes you feel like an easy and good fit, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. Um, so we have another question that just came in. Do we know resources to find nonprofit work? Honestly, this would be a great takeaway for the WIP Project team to put together a guide for people who want to volunteer with nonprofits. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I would just say, you know, search for causes you're passionate about and be like, hey, do you want some free tech work? But if anyone else has any better suggestions, please jump in. Oh, we got one. Someone said pursuit.org, a selfless plug. We got to plug ourselves in this life, Alex. So it's all good. <laughs> anyone um, else any suggestions? Yeah, there are some platforms, the names are escaping me, but we will share them after the webinar is over. Um, platforms that actually connect technologists to uh, projects that nonprofits are working on. So you can volunteer your time and kind of, uh, you know, translate some of that knowledge from your day to day um, to those nonprofits or learn, you know, off the, off the cuff. Um, but you're able to kind of just, um, I guess, decide like what your time commitment is because you're volunteering. So if you have 10 hours a week, then you say that straight up and you say, I can work on this specific feature of something for 10 hours a week. So uh, we'll send that afterwards uh, to all of the attendees. Very cool. Um, another great question we have, um, good student project suggestions for FinTech related or security projects. John or Lane, do you wanna take this one? Um, I, I would lean on, on Shiley's suggestion on checking out an API to play with. For example, there are specific um, APIs that you can play with. There are some platforms, for example, Duola is a, is a platform to handle payments. Uh, or, or, or maybe you can play with uh, other, other APIs. Um, the only thing to check out in, is, is to do the research, is, is, if it's possible to get a trial account. Yeah. But, but you can you can get um, you can manage to get a trial account and build an API integration, and that would be very beneficial because it's not only about the technology that you play with; it's more uh, the concepts that you play with. You you uh, start um, learning about accounts, payments, interests, or delays, um, and you can you can definitely uh, get an, an advantage by working on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, and someone put in the chat um, about kind of a stock market um, API. And I think that um, kind of the complexity surrounding moving money around makes me think that, you know, trying to build your own like cash app probably wouldn't um, go super well. But something like just a, a simple app that um, grabs like uh, a bunch of stocks and how they're doing, you could specify which stocks you're interested in seeing. And, you know, that's just something really simple where it's like you're connecting with an API and you're displaying the data, but there's not really, um, you know, a ton of work to kind of make sure it's secure and that money's going where it's supposed to go. Um, so I think that that would be like a good kind of beginner project. Yeah. Someone also says earning tracker app. Very exciting. I also always like a personal finance app. People always need help with their personal finances. Most people are hot messes. <laughs> um, okay, awesome. I love this energy right now. I love brainstorming projects. Alex Paul is really bringing a lot to the chat right now. We got a link, we got an idea. We got, if you want to volunteer, check out Alex's email, all in the chat. And Charlie's put another one. Oh wait, awesome. Well, there's no more questions. Um, I just wanna thank all of our amazing panelists for coming out today. 
I want to thank Outco for helping to coordinate this fabulous panel. I want to thank the WIP Project team, which feels weird because I'm on that team, but I guess we got we to gotta affirm ourselves in this life. Um, I want to thank everyone on the WIP Project team, Shiley, Hannah, Patty, who's on the Outco team, um, for helping to coordinate this all together. Thank you to Lee and John for volunteering to be a part of this amazing panel and giving us such great insights. I had a lot of fun doing this. Uh, and I really, really hope that all of y'all, I guess, happy virtual Halloween. That is true. I keep forgetting we're almost at the end of October, spooky season. Uh, I just want to thank all of y'all for coming out tonight, for listening, uh, for engaging with us. Hopefully you all learned something. Uh, you know, stay engaged with our organization. Check out Outco. Check out the WIP Project. Uh, the WIP Project, we have some really exciting volunteer opportunities coming up. Um, and yeah, we, we hope to, you know, we hear from all of you in the future. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Jules. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everyone.